Even if its predetermined nature prevents it from being a true sport, there's always been a sporting element to our favorite form of theater. The best wrestlers are high caliber athletes doing athletic things, no doubt, but ultimately, wrestling has always straddled that line between sports and entertainment. Ooh, someone should turn that into a term. Though not an official requirement, having an athletic background doesn't hurt when entering the profession, as sports and competition tend to help build the discipline and attributes needed to succeed. Ever since Ricky Starr graced the squared circle with his classically trained ballet moves in the 1950s, athletes from other sports have been part of the fabric of pro wrestling. Look at any successful wrestler throughout history, and they usually have experience in other sports. From Vern Gagne to the Iron Sheik, Kurt Angle to Brock Lesnar, Shelton Benjamin to Chad Gable, tons of grapplers got their start in amateur wrestling. Names such as Jim Duggan, Wahoo McDaniel, Bill Goldberg, Ron Simmons, Vader and Ernie Ladd cut their teeth in professional football before entering the ring. Kevin Nash was a championship basketball player for the University of Tennessee. Olympic powerlifters like Ken Patera and Mark Henry are legends in the business. The Macho Man Randy Savage was known to have aspirations of playing professional baseball before becoming a wrestler, and I have no doubt that any baseball game would be a lot more interesting by injecting a little bit of madness into it. Yeah, dig it! Strike three, you're out! Uh -huh. Current NXT signee Casey Catanzaro is the only woman to have completed the American Ninja Warrior final course. Vanessa Bourne, Naomi, and Carmella spent time as dancers for NBA teams before moving to wrestling, and Dana Brooke and Alexa Bliss were both successful professional bodybuilders. And let's not forget that newly minted UFC Hall of Famer Ronda Rousey isn't doing too bad making the switch to pro wrestling herself. The list of examples goes on and on. But far more interesting than the common practice of a pro athlete transitioning to wrestling is injecting those other sports into wrestling itself. This week, I'm looking at wrestlers who have used other sports as part of their character. For this review, I'm not including legit athletes who only made guest appearances in wrestling, so no Tyson, no Rodman or Malone, no Butterbean, no Gronk, and no Fridge. When you think about sports characters in wrestling, the goon is often one of the first examples people come up with, and for good reason. To my knowledge, the only hockey-based character in the history of wrestling to date, it's especially memorable for being especially horrible. The goon, portrayed by Bill Irwin, was supposed to be a hockey player who was kicked out of every league he ever competed in due to his dirty style of play. So by that logic, he would do wonders in the world of professional wrestling. Give the WWF credit where it's due, they put a lot of detail into this character. First appearing on an episode of Superstars in July of 1996, the peak of the guys with day jobs era, he came to the ring in Jersey with a glove and stick, and even the soles of his boots were sculpted to look like ice skates. The boots gave him another few inches of height, no doubt inspired and came to do the same thing a year later. As soon as that bell rang, the gloves were off and a hockey fight broke out. He would even incorporate a boarding penalty into his finishes, though Vincent Mann would erroneously refer to it as a cross-check on commentary. The gimmick lasted only a few months before being scrapped, probably once the company got tired of making constant Gretzky and Lemieux references. But he was so memorable and quote-unquote beloved by the fans, the goons returned twice at WWE since then. Once the gimmick battle royal match at WrestleMania 17 in 2001, and again on Raw's 15th anniversary episode in 2008. Truly a gimmick that made the most of his five minutes for fighting, despite lasting less time than an NHL season during a strike year. Speaking of which, while player strike happens pretty regularly in the NHL, it's slightly more rare to see a work stoppage in baseball. When America's pastime last went on a hiatus, the whole country threw a fit, and few capitalized on that quite like the WWF. There is the infamous promo they ran during the 94 strike that prevented the World Series from happening, starring the aforementioned Randy Savage, but a more on-the-nose commentary came in the form of Abe Knuckleball Schwartz, played by the Brooklyn Brawler. I'm not sure if this is the WWF genuinely attempting to fill the void left by Major League Baseball in order to attract fans, or their way of poking fun at the league's mishaps. But considering Abe resembled the silliest member of the Baseball Furies, I'm gonna guess it was the latter. The Knuckleball, who was actually an updated version of an older gimmick that Steve Lombardi had played in the past, was a bitter baseball player who blamed fans for the players' strike, a leap in logic so outrageous and profound that whoever came up with that idea should have been ejected from the company Bobby Cox style. Like the goon, this was another short-lived gimmick, and Lombardi would go back to his more famous persona by the end of the year. Now, before you accuse me of piling on, don't worry, because the WWF was by far not the only company to dabble in silly sports gimmicks. 
Meet Mr. Holden One Barry Darso. The man who got his huge break on the national scene as Demolition Smash back in the 80s, Darso would then have a sudden change in gimmick as the Repo Man, wrestling's own version of the Hamburglar. But in the midst of his second run in WCW, Darso would ditch the spiked leather pads and raccoon mask and trade them in for some comfy slacks and a set of clubs, as the world's only wrestling golfer until Kerwin White did it years later. So when did this gimmick exist, you might ask? Sometime in the late 80s or early to mid 1990s, the height of that cheesy gimmick period? No, no, no. Mr. Hole in One debuted in 1998. That means while the World Wrestling Federation was promoting D-Generation X and Stone Cold Steve Austin and Sable and Inferno matches and first blood matches, WCW had a wrestling golfer. <laughs> no wonder the Federation was on the ropes for as long as they were, huh? The idea of plucking an athlete from another sport and dropping them right into wrestling look unchanged has been going on forever. The goon, Abe Schwartz, Mark Jendrak's thankfully short-lived stint as Basket Case in WCW, hell, at this very moment, one of Chikara's most popular characters is Mr. Touchdown. Then you have one of the most successful examples of a character with a gimmick of established athlete in Rodney Anawaii, better known as Yokozuna. Built up as a sumo wrestler with something to prove in the professional ranks in America, Yoko had a run of dominance dominance the company, becoming a multiple-time WWE World and Tag Team Champion. One of the biggest heels of the 90s, in more ways than one, Yokozuna sadly passed away as a result of his weight issues in 2000 and was posthumously inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2012. It was certainly a more impressive run than an actual sumo champion in Akibono. And after you get past all those characters based on other sports, you get some of the more ambiguous athletes, like professional something-something MVP. In the weeks leading up to his debut in 2006, Montel Vontavious Porter was touted as wrestling's hottest free agent, despite the fact that Porter had no prior experience in another major federation before this, and most fans unfamiliar with anything non-WWE had no clue who he was. The depiction of MVP as an entitled star athlete demanding a fat contract wasn't unlike that of a basketball or football player doing the same thing, but his actual background was never defined. I mean, the ball and taunts, an obvious basketball reference, but his overdrive finisher one of the worst in wrestling, by the way, was kind of similar to a Heisman pose. Throw in the fact that his gear somewhat resembled a scuba suit, and now I'm just totally lost. While portraying him in the midst of tense contract negotiations was a memorable way to debut him, it never really felt fleshed out to me. Maybe the man who would eventually become the first ever IWGP Intercontinental Champion was supposed to be a professional Power Ranger. But there was nothing ambiguous about the Spirit Squad. They were loud, obnoxious male cheerleaders, and they let you know it. It was simple. Not necessarily good, but you know, it was easy to understand. The squad was apparently birthed directly from the mind of Vince McMahon, who took five of the most talented guys in OVW and turned them into his green and white henchmen for a spell in the mid-2000s. Though the gimmick was silly, they were pushed to the moon, battling with Shawn Michaels and Triple H on multiple occasions. As a team, the lads won the Raw tag titles after beating the hell out of two old men and held them for more than 200 days. Gotta hand it to the quintet for really sinking their teeth into the characters and going all out with the goofy dances, though they had a shocking lack of synchronization for a group that was supposed to be a top-tier cheerleading squad. In November 2006, this gimmick died one of the most frustrating deaths imaginable, as our boys in green were literally shipped back to developmental by D-Generation X, the final in a growing number of insults, the mere existence of the team among them. Whether it was intentional or not, this visual sent a clear message to viewers and wrestlers alike that these guys weren't meant to be taken seriously, and they weren't ready to perform at the same level as the real WWE stars. Out of the carnage, only one member survived to have any kind of success in the company, that being Dolph Ziggler, the former Nick. Ken Doan was a distant second in terms of having a life after the Spirit Squad, as his only defining character trait as a single star was that he couldn't legally buy alcohol. So the young Kenny Dykstra, and Kenny's only 20 years old. I'm not even 21 years old. But the Spirit Squad could have looked very different. According to rumor, CM Punk was considered to be part of the original five, and while the sight of a tattooed, perpetually tired-looking Phil Brooks dancing in the ring like an idiot in green track pants would have been an amazing visual, it would have made his appearance as a nameless mobster at WrestleMania 23 seem tame by comparison. It's been said that Elijah Burke also passed it a chance to join the squad, eventually becoming the mouthpiece for another sporting gimmick. Sylvester Turkai may be a footnote in American pro wrestling, but like so many rock and pop music stars who have fizzled out in the States, he had much more success in Japan as a two-sport athlete. In fact, that's what apparently inspired his gimmick of an MMA fighter upon entering WWE in 2006. 
Having spent time in Pro Wrestling Zero One under the name Predator, Turkai spent his off time competing in K1 MMA matches. Despite earning some impressive victories, he wasn't seen of any value as a competitor due to his status as a relative unknown. Upon debuting for WWE, flanked by the aforementioned Elijah Burke, Turkai was booked as a dominant fighter with an impressive unbeaten streak, not unlike that of Brock Lesnar a few years earlier. But despite the initial early push on the ECW brand and SmackDown, Turkai would be released from the company with little fanfare and even less explanation. To this day, nobody's been able to explain why they released the guy, especially in the midst of his win streak. What's even more mysterious about his departure from the company was, he wasn't even that bad of a wrestler. Okay, he wasn't exactly oozing with charisma, but that never stopped other guys from sticking around. Turkai's release was kind of unfortunate, as it isn't unheard of for the MMA to wrestling transition to go smoothly. In a time when mixed martial arts was still considered an illegal blood sport by most athletic commissions, the inclusion of octagon icons Dan Severn and Ken Shamrock lent a degree of legitimacy to professional wrestling that hadn't been seen in quite some time. Unlike the character of the supreme fighting machine Kama Mustafa, played by former voodoo priest and future pimp Charles Wright, Shamrock and Severn came into the World Wrestling Federation with actual MMA backgrounds. Both men would earn valuable accolades and notoriety in the business, as Shamrock was crowned the 1998 King of the Ring and would become one of the better Intercontinental Champions in the late 90s. Dan Severn, besides having easily one of the top 10 mustaches in the history of the biz, could be seen walking to the ring on Monday Night Raw with those famous 10 pounds of gold as NWA World World's heavyweight champion. Throw in the early success of Ronda Rousey as I mentioned and evidence shows it is possible to make that transition from MMA to professional wrestling. But what about boxing? Already covered it. Got any other examples of sporty gimmicks in wrestling I might have missed? Let me know in the comment section below. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane and I'll see you next time.